Yo! New settings, shorter length because I felt like I was losing my mind editing the last video. I also call NVIDIA NVIDIA now because apparently me calling it something else in my previous videos offends people and makes them re very hard. So yeah, no more fun you guys. Anywho, in this updated NVIDIA control panel tutorial, I'm going to be giving you even more tips to get the best image quality without sacrificing FPS. As usual, I'll be showing examples of the settings in action as well as benchmarks. I'll also be giving my personal recommendations throughout the tutorial on what I think should be used on different setups and why. Keep in mind this tutorial's main purpose is to show you what each of the settings do so you can make an educated decision about what's best to use on your hardware, rather than me simply just telling you what to select without telling you why. Also keep in mind that the purpose of the NVIDIA control panel isn't to give you more FPS, its whole point is to allow you to fine tune image quality. If you're looking for a tutorial specifically to increase your FPS, the best way is through GPU overclocking. I actually made an in-depth GPU overclocking tutorial recently, which I really recommend you watch after this one. All right, let's get started today, like a somebody. I've had some previous comments from people saying they have the control panel, but they can't see the display and video settings. If this happens, you probably have a laptop where the integrated graphics handle those settings instead, and the integrated graphics would have their own control panel. If you're missing the whole NVIDIA control panel, try searching for it on your computer, but if you still can't find it, Download and install NVIDIA GeForce Experience because it should also install the control panel with it. To be fair, you should already have GeForce Experience anyway because they have useful recording features, plus they've recently added performance overlays so you can monitor things like FPS, latency, temps, and a range of other things while you're gaming. If the control panel is missing after installing GeForce Experience, another thing you can try doing is a fresh install of the drivers. So to do this, open it, click drivers, click the three dots here, and click reinstall driver. When these options pop up, up, click custom installation, then make sure everything is selected and choose perform a clean installation, done. For everyone else who doesn't have underperforming console like hardware, god I missed this, right click your desktop and open the NVIDIA control panel. This should be the first thing you see, make sure use the advanced 3D image settings is selected as this will give us complete control over our image quality settings. So either click manage 3D settings or click here. So the difference between global settings and program settings is global will affect all GPU accelerated games and and applications, whereas program settings allows you to choose a specific game or program. It's important to set up your global settings precisely how you'd like everything to look, because when you click program settings, it carries over the global settings you have as the default template, making it easier to adjust particular settings if for some reason the global settings don't work for that particular game or program. All right, image sharpening. If you have a beast of a PC and you're more than happy to sacrifice some FPS for improved image quality, feel free to experiment around with image sharpening. One thing NVIDIA have changed since the last video is they've gotten rid of GPU scaling. Good. The idea behind GPU scaling being an option in the image sharpening section was useless. Because if you're going to lower your resolution in games like they suggest for higher FPS, then why would you apply a setting that would again reduce your FPS? Plus, it looks absolutely AIDS if that's what you're using it for. As you can see here, ambient occlusion, let's go. The point of ambient occlusion is to make shadows look more realistic. If the game you're playing has an ambient occlusion option and you're fine with taking a minor performance hit, turn it on in the game itself because it will give you much better results than turning it on in the NVIDIA control panel. Enabling it here will force ambient occlusion in every game, even those that weren't designed to have it, which may result in glitching shadows. All right, anisotropic filtering. Anisotropic filtering improves the image quality in all games by making surfaces look clearer and more detailed. So make sure you set this to 16 times and press apply. The main benefit of making this a global setting in the NVIDIA control panel is that it will force anisotropic tropic filtering on, even in games that weren't designed to have it. If you ever notice graphical artifacts like water, walls, or any other objects flickering in your games, make sure anisotropic filtering is turned off in the game itself and that the NVIDIA control panel is the only place where anisotropic filtering is enabled. If you've done all that and the objects are still flickering, your game's in-game anti-aliasing options are probably the cause. I say this because my last video attracted a few Fortnite and Warzone players who at first blamed me for this happening in their trash games. Some fix it by changing their in-game anti-aliasing to TAA. Maybe one day they'll even fix their poor choice in games. I doubt it though. And with that, let's talk about anti-aliasing. The point of anti-aliasing is to smooth the appearance of jagged edges. There are different types of anti-aliasing options and FXAA is definitely the peasant one. There aren't too many games out there that support FXAA, which is very nice because someone with a concussion could probably draw smoother lines. If you're a fan of text-heavy games and you force FXAA on using the NVIDIA control panel, this can make the text less 
less legible. Gamma correction is supposed to show edges that have anti-aliasing applied at an appropriate level of contrast. I still have no idea why they haven't removed gamma correction from the control panel yet, as it doesn't matter if you have this setting on or off. It literally doesn't do a thing. All games have already been appropriately adjusted for gamma, which was done during their development, which is why you never see this option in any game. So yeah, on or off, whatever, apply, good to go. Very nice. This should already be on application controlled by default. I recommend not touching this setting because if you choose to either enhance or override application controlled anti-aliasing, this could produce anti-aliasing render conflicts. Since we're leaving this on application controlled, this will be blanked out. Moving on. Here's another obsolete setting that makes it seem even more likely that a child intern was given the responsibility to work on this whole control panel. Turn this setting on if you enjoy anti-aliasing render conflicts combined with a decrease in FPS. If that doesn't sound appealing, keep it the hell off. Background application max frame rate is a new setting. I personally love it because I'm always multitasking, which is the technical term people with 10 second attention spans use. If you're alt-tabbing out of a game to do something, instead of the game using up all of your resources and slowing your computer down, this setting allows the FPS in your game to automatically be capped to the number you've set here, which will significantly free up resources. So to free up the most amount of resources when you alt-tab out of games, I recommend setting this to 20 FPS. What it doesn't say here is that this setting only seems to work with games that are in borderless or windowed, not full screen. So make sure to go into your display options for the game and set the display to borderless windowed, which is what you should already be doing in the first place, because here's what happens when you alt tab out of games in full screen mode. Have fun trying to multitask with that shit. If you can still hear the sounds from the game after you've alt tabbed out, that's how you know you've got everything set up correctly for background application max frame rate to take effect. All right, so I suspect this setting's main purpose is to flex on console and laptop owners by letting them know that if they had a desktop, they could actually have two GPUs. Kinda overkill. But then again, they do deserve the constant reminder that their options are limited. So if you have more than one GPU, this setting allows you to select your most powerful one to be used by default for when you run programs and games that are GPU accelerated to increase performance. DSR factors. So this setting allows you to downsample higher resolutions to your monitor's native resolution. So if you're a poor person like me, you could have resolutions up to 4K downsampled on your peasant 1080p monitor. DSR factors will improve image quality in new and old games with no graphical conflicts. Edges on objects will appear smoother, including transparent textures. It also improves the clarity of shadows, textures, and shaders. It's completely safe to tick all of these as it will only take effect once you choose one of these resolutions in game. So once you've ticked everything and pressed apply, boot up any game, go into your display settings, you'll be able to select resolutions all the way up to 4K. Does anyone else remember the original Psychonauts when it released over 16 years ago in 4K? Ha! This setting is super cute. Cool. Keep in mind though, the higher the resolution you choose to be downsampled, the higher the performance impact. You probably won't notice it in older games like this, but you will in new ones. DSR smoothness. This setting only works if you've enabled DSR factors. What DSR smoothness does is it applies higher intensities of Gaussian to DSR images. It won't affect your performance in any way, so feel free to experiment around with it and find your preference. I personally like the default setting, 33%. All right, so we're at the halfway mark now, and I bet some of you are crying hard about the length. Please, please, sir. Won't you spoon feed me the setting so I can go back to playing my all time favorite games, Minecraft, Fortnite, or Warzone? By all means, you're welcome to watch the low effort trash made by other YouTubers with a monkey say, monkey do mentality, where they will tell you what to change without telling you why, all the while claiming you will get a significant FPS boost without showing you one benchmark. I hope the settings they give you make it so you have to spend another 15 hours looking at what went wrong after you apply them, you bastards. Low latency mode. So if you're a pretend esports wannabe, then you probably care about having low latency in the only game you'll ever play. Again, Minecraft, Fortnite, or Warzone. For this setting, you'll have to experiment with it because different things happen depending on which option you choose, which game you're testing it with, and what setup you have. The video themselves say, low latency modes have the most impact when your game is GPU bound and frame rates are between 60 and 100 FPS. If you have a compatible NVIDIA GPU combined with a G-Sync monitor, you can also try NVIDIA Reflex, which can give you up to 33% lower latency in supported online competitive games. Quick update, I still don't have a G-Sync monitor, so I hope when you enable this setting that yours explodes. If I can't have nice things, you shouldn't be allowed to either. To turn on Reflex, go to your in-game graphics settings, and it should be there if it's supported for that game. Once you enable Reflex, you can use the NVIDIA Reflex Latency Analyzer, which is a system latency measurement tool that has been built into every G-Sync display, so you can see 
see the results after tweaking the low latency mode and reflex. Max frame rate. If you're using this setting specifically for the power saving elements outlined here, all I can say is if you're a true environmentalist, you'd probably destroy anything that could harm the planet in a 100 kilometer radius. Otherwise, be labeled for what you are, which is a hypocrite. I recommend leaving the setting off entirely because it can cause stuttering frame rates and crashes in games you know ran completely fine before you turned it on. If you notice any system latency affecting specific games that doesn't happen in any others, by system latency this can include input latency, how the game engine itself runs, for example lower than normal or irregular FPS, or the latency between your GPU and your monitor. Here's what NVIDIA recommends you do. Because we don't want these settings affecting all games, click program settings, locate the game that has system latency issues, then apply the settings. Max frame rate works best if you set your max frame rate two frames below your monitor's refresh rate, which is why you can see when I turn it on, it does this by default. And yes, I have a 60 hertz monitor, so 58 frames per second, done. I tried these settings with Rise Son of Rome, and trust me, my life is more optimized than that game is. It didn't matter if the graphics were maxed out or on low, it only ever reached 35% of the GPU and CPU being utilized according to Task Manager, and I was still getting stuttering frame rates. However, after applying the settings, it made the frame rates noticeably more consistent and the game actually playable. It was still far from perfect, so don't expect a miracle. Some games, like Cyberpunk, are just unoptimized trash that will just never get fixed. MFAA's purpose is to give you anti-aliasing results similar to MSAA at a lower cost of performance. Here's a picture without anti-aliasing, and here's a picture with four times MSAA enabled. If you turn on MFAA in the NVIDIA control panel, and I highly recommend you do, it activates in games when you select two times MSAA or above. So here you can see four times MSAA, and here you can see two times MSAA that has had multi-frame sampled AA automatically applied to it thanks to the NVIDIA control panel. Looking at them side by side, there really isn't much difference in image quality. If you look at the FPS in the corner, you'll see that two times MSAA with MFAA applied to it has less of a performance impact. Because of this, I highly recommend you turn this setting on. Oh look, it's a new setting! Wow! Let's see what it does! Select the GPU to be used by OpenGL applications, choosing the more powerful GPU to render an application. Nice grammar. Rendering different applications on different GPUs. Alright, so this setting is useless then. If you have more than one GPU, you're obviously going to come up here and select your best GPU. So you can come down here and choose your weaker one? Why wouldn't you choose the best GPU you have for both instances? Hey, I have an idea. Just make these, right? Stay with me. One setting. You geniuses. Power management mode. If you choose optimal power, your GPU will save power by reusing pre-rendered frames if nothing's happening on your screen. If your GPU tends to get hot, this is the best setting to choose for reducing temperatures. Adaptive sucks because it'll reduce your clock speeds to save power while you're playing games, which is the last thing you'd want because this can cause stuttering frame rates and bad performance. A lot of YouTubers out there try to make it sound like you'll get more performance by choosing max performance, but as I showed in my last video, I reached out to NVIDIA customer support and they said maximum performance will try to hold the GPU at high clocks all the time, no matter the actual workload. While it sounds like it might give bigger performance, actually, all it does is waste power during undemanding tasks. While in demanding tasks, it will perform identically with optimal. Optimal power will let the GPU work less when its full power is actually not needed, while still giving 100% when you're playing your daily dose of vidya. Optimal is what you want to use. So again, don't listen to those low IQ <laughs> bastards telling you to choose maximum performance. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. Choose optimal power today. Shader cache. They updated the shader cache setting while I was recording, which is pretty lucky. Now it looks like this and you'll see all of these options. The shader cache will store compiled shader files in your hard disk drive which speeds up game loading times, reduces stuttering, and improves performance in games. A lot of kind people in my discord server were able to show me how large their DX cache and GL cache folders were, which you can find yourselves here. I've seen these folders take up anywhere between 50 meg to around 6 gigabytes so far. It would be nice if Nvidia told us how much space driver default takes up, because the way this all works is if it reaches a defined value, it'll delete the oldest shader cache files first to make room for the new ones. When shader cache was originally added, the driver default was 250 meg, but there's a 250 meg option here, so who the hell knows what it does now. For those who checked how large their DX cache and GL cache folders were, use the size of the folders and the oldest file dates within those folders to help you determine which setting you think is best. You don't want shader files from applications you haven't used in months, or games you finished ages ago and uninstalled to just 
be sitting on your drive wasting space? Which would happen if you chose unlimited? Why is this even an option? For everyone else, I personally think choosing 1 gig or 5 gig should be plenty, but it really depends on what you do on your PC, which is why I urge you to check your folders and the dates of the oldest files within those folders. It literally takes a few seconds to check, so don't be the very lazy one today. Alright, so now we arrive at 4 texture filtering options. If you set texture filtering quality to quality, which it should already be on by default, it will turn off anisotropic sample optimization and turn on trilinear optimization. If you choose high quality, it turns off both of the texture filtering optimization settings, which is why they're blanked out. If you choose performance, it turns on both texture filtering quality settings, and if you choose high performance, it doesn't seem to change a goddamn thing. Knowing NVIDIA have made tweaks to the control panel, I ran new benchmarks of all the texture filtering quality settings twice, so I know they're consistent, and they are different to the ones I took previously, even though I still have the same hardware. First, let's talk about negative level of detail bias and what the texture filtering optimizations actually do, because this should influence your choice just as much as the benchmarks. Classic NVIDIA with another useless setting cluttering their control panel to make it seem like they're actually working hard. In most games now, you can't even force this feature to work. So the purpose of negative level of detail bias is to improve the resolution quality of textures that are further away from you. If you try to brute force this by setting it to allow, you could end up with shimmering, glitchy textures. NVIDIA in their infinite wisdom set this to allow as default, regardless of what texture filtering quality settings you choose. If you want to improve the quality of textures without glitching them, do what I recommended earlier, which is set anisotropic filtering to 16 times. It has very little impact on performance and it doesn't glitch textures. So be sure to clamp this setting. Anisotropic sample optimization's main purpose is to lower the performance impact anisotropic filtering has on your system, which is why NVIDIA turns it on when you select performance under texture filtering quality. So let's see if that's true. Here's a time spy benchmark with anisotropic sample optimization turned on. Here's another with it turned off. Wow, thank you so much for giving me that extra 0.3 FPS. Now I can play all games on max settings. LOL. For those of you who are wondering if it improves image quality, here's a picture of it turned on. Here's a picture with it off. Even though it seems like there's no difference between having it on or off in this example, if there's even a remote possibility that having anisotropic sample optimization turned on will interfere with the image quality you want to achieve by setting anisotropic filtering to 16 times, you want it off. Under the typical usage scenarios for anisotropic sample optimization, NVIDIA recommends turning it off if you notice shimmering objects. With all this in mind, there are a lot more disadvantages that could occur if you decide to have this setting on rather than off. Now, onto trilinear optimization. The purpose of trilinear optimization is to work in combination with anisotropic filtering, which is supposed to give you a higher quality picture. I see NVIDIA suggests here that trilinear optimization be switched off for the best image quality, even though they turn it on by default when you select quality. Nice one, morons. Here's a picture of 16 times anisotropic filtering turned on and trilinear optimization turned off. Here's another picture with 16 times anisotropic filtering on with trilinear optimization. Here they are side by side, showing there's literally no difference in image quality, whether trilinear optimization is turned on or off. So they also got that wrong in their own control panel. However, if you look at the benchmarks, you'll see that when trilinear optimization is turned on, it gave me a graphic score increase of 164 points, an extra 1.29 FPS in the first graphics test, and 0.77 FPS in the second. So from this information, I can expect to gain around 1 FPS if I keep it turned on. So here are the benchmarks of all the texture filtering quality settings. You'll notice that high quality gave me the worst score because it turns off anisotropic sample optimization and trilinear optimization. Since trilinear optimization looks no different on or off, there's no reason anyone would choose high quality over quality. Something to keep in mind when buying your next GPU from NVIDIA is that they consider high performance as something only slightly better than performance if these benchmarks are anything to go by. In my last video, high performance actually did worse on benchmarks in comparison to the performance setting. So here are my recommendations. If you're an eSports wannabe, go with the slightly higher FPS option, so high performance. A small FPS increase you gain probably won't make anyone's morning wood rise any higher in the mornings. But hey, you play free to play trash anyway, so your standards were already low. For everyone else, if you care about image quality, leave it on quality to ensure anisotropic sample optimization won't jeopardize it. You'll also be getting a slight FPS boost by keeping trilinear optimization turned on without any sacrifice to image quality. Oh my god, I can see the bottom. The end is near! Threaded optimization offloads GPU processing tasks to separate threads of your multi-core hyper-threaded CPU to improve performance. Leave this on default, which should already be set to auto because changing it 
it can result in performance problems. Triple buffering. When your GPU renders, two frames are stored in the video RAM, which is a process called double buffering. They found that if you have VSync enabled to prevent screen tearing and your frame rate falls below your monitor's refresh rate, this could cause the GPU to become idle because it's waiting for the next refresh cycle. Triple buffering was introduced to stop your frame rate falling below the refresh rate by adding three frames instead of two to be stored in the video RAM. Before we continue, I just gotta ask, played any OpenGL games recently? Yeah, me neither. All I see now is either DirectX or Vulkan, and no I'm not talking about Mr. Spock. This setting only works with OpenGL games because DirectX manages its own internal frame buffering. If you do play an OpenGL game, just remember that triple buffering only improves performance if it's enabled when VSync is turned on. I recommend leaving this off under global settings and only turning it on for OpenGL games when you need to in the program settings section. Vertical Sync. I have a 60 hertz monitor so I consider myself a master at this setting because I notice screen tearing all the goddamn time if I don't have VSync enabled on my trash monitor. Here's what it looks like. If you have a 60 hertz monitor, turn VSync on in the game itself rather than making it a global setting. I say this because turning it on in the control panel could cause input lag and performance drops in games that don't reach 60 FPS. If you have a G-Sync monitor or G-Sync compatible FreeSync monitor and you experience screen tearing, you want to enable V-Sync in the control panel, not the game itself. According to Blurbusters. And the reason I'm getting my information from them is because some people in the comments on my last video recommended them, saying they fixed their screen tearing issues they were having on their G-Sync monitors. So here's some information from their website regarding the best settings to change in the NVIDIA control panel to eliminate screen tearing on G-Sync monitors, which I'll also link in the video's description. I'll be sure to buy a G-Sync monitor before I update this video so I can try these settings myself. But again, I'm sure they'll work because of their reputation and what I've heard from people who have actually tried them. By the way, if you have an RTX or GTX 16 series GPU and are a fan of pixel art games like Faster Than Light or Hotline Miami, you may have noticed if you've upgraded your monitor to a higher resolution that these games appear blurry in comparison to when you played them on your monitor with a lower resolution. The blurriness is caused by these games being scaled to fit a larger display area. So on the left is a picture of FTL being played at 4K and on the right is a picture of FTL being played at 4K but with integer scaling turned on. Integer scaling's main purpose is to preserve the game's intended style and appearance no matter what display resolution you're playing it on. To turn this setting on, click adjust desktop size and position here, then click integer scaling and make sure perform scaling on GPU is selected and that's it. If anyone remembers maximum pre-rendered frames when it used to be in the control panel before it was replaced by low latency mode, this is basically that. This setting allows you to control the maximum number of frames your CPU prepares in advance before it's rendered by the GPU. Setting this to 4 will give you smoother frame rates if your CPU is on par with your GPU, but this increases your chances of input lag which is pretty serious when it comes to VR. You're more at risk of giving yourself a literal headache playing VR games if there's input lag because it's disorienting if you turn your head in VR and your VR headset takes time to catch up with your movements. So based on this, you want the latency to be as low as possible. If you set this to application default, it will use the value determined by the game, making it the most logical setting to use if NVIDIA's default setting isn't working out for you. And if you have someone in your life you hate, be sure to set this to 4 and invite them over to try out your new VR headset in the hopes that they'll leave your house with the worst migraine they've ever had. Variable Rate Super Sampling or VRSS helps improve image quality in VR games by applying 8 times super sampling which is focused at the center of the VR headset display. If your GPU has a lot of headroom because nothing much is happening on your screen, the VR RSS will expand. It will also get smaller if too much happens on your screen, so you can maintain high FPS at all times while still getting 8 times super sampling. First thing, I don't know why they would add a setting as useful as this and leave it off by default. If you don't want anyone to use it, why add it at all? Secondly, if you select always on, it defeats the purpose of calling this setting variable rate super sampling because it will always apply 8 times super sampling to a fixed region which never changes in size. If your FPS is trash, because a lot of things are happening on your screen, it won't ease up on the super sampling, making everything worse, and this setting pointless. Thanks again, NVIDIA interns! For a setting like this, the only options that should exist are off and adaptive, because adaptive is the setting you need to choose to actually make it variable rate super sampling and to work as intended. Over 30 games support it, which is why I recommend changing this setting from the default to adaptive. So yeah, I hope you learned one or even two things. Since I'm streaming a lot on Twitch, the next video will be an OBS settings tutorial because I know it will help people who are struggling with common problems like audio levels, quality settings, etc. I hope you have a good one today.